welcome uh, to the program. My name is Marty Shankman. I'm joined uh, by a friend and colleague, Joy. I'm going to say your name wrong, and you're going to like yell at me later. Matak. It's okay. <laughs> Matak. Matak. Joy Matak from Saks. I run the Trusted Estates team here. I'm very excited to join my friend Marty uh, and other friends that are going to be joining us from time to time. So what what we're going to do, and this is, we're, we're trying to make this a little different because it seems like we all spend much of every week watching uh, webinars. We're trying to do something a little different. We're trying to make this a little more informal. Um, and Mike is going to be an example of that. We're going to hold him up as a shining participant in a second. But we're going to try to discuss a single topic, a question, an issue that all of us see in practice. Uh, the issue for this, uh, our first installment of what hopefully will be a monthly series, is I have a grant or trust. I'm tired of paying the income tax on it. What can I do? If you haven't seen that question from a client, you haven't heard that question, uh, you will. Mike, you have to mute because the background noise is not good. Um, so you will hear that question. With the proliferation of uh, grant or trusts, especially in recent years, 2012, and then another surge in 2020, 2021, and we're going to see another surge in planning. It's, it's already starting before the 2025, end of 2025 reduction in the exemption. There are so many grantor trusts out there, and for you Star Trek fans, they are multiplying like tribbles. If you don't know what I'm talking about, shame on you. You have to go watch that Star Trek episode. But um, we're going to talk about that practical issue and what you can do in practice. And we thought a more informal conversation of a real issue focusing on, like, what do you talk to a client about? Not just what the technical background issues are, would be really useful to all of you um, uh, attending. Now, Mike is our shining example. And uh, I'm going to send home a, a gold star that he's going to put on his refrigerator. If all of you remember, like in grade school, when we were good and got the answer on the spelling questions right, we, we got gold stars to take home. Um, Mike, I actually didn't even know until a day ago. Mike uh, emailed a, a question, a comment about using an insurance wrapper to um, capture or block the taxable income of investments inside a trust. And that wasn't on my radar screen to talk about, so Mike is going to uh, uh, come back on at the end of the program. Uh, I'll let him introduce himself, and he's going to talk to us, and we'll chat with him uh, about that uh, interesting uh, twist on how to plan for grant or trust tax burn that's uh, 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 upsetting the uh, grant or the client. Uh, Mike, so if, if you want to go off, we, we appreciate it. We'll, we'll see you soon. Don't go away. Thanks, Mike. Sounds good. Yep. Okay. Now, um, it's my uh, custom to try every time I do a webinar, I don't make it 100% of the time, but I try to uh, feature a charity. And I think for this webinar series that I'm doing with Joy, uh, the American Cancer Society is going to uh, be a charity that's going to uh, make a little plug each time. And maybe if we get more creative or if any of you have some creative charitable ideas, we can tie those in with the American Cancer Society. And... Um, uh, uh, tie that into a future program. Jennifer, why don't you make a uh, quick uh, elevator pitch about the American Cancer Society? And just so you all know, whoops, wrong side, I guess, with the video. This is a, a, a pin from the American Cancer Society. I've been an active volunteer working with them for many, many, many years. Uh, Jennifer? Thank you so much, Marty, for the opportunity to be on today's call and for all you do to support our mission. At the American Cancer Society, our mission is to improve the lives of people with cancer and their families through advocacy, research, and patient support to ensure everyone has an opportunity to prevent, detect, treat, and survive cancer. You have an opportunity to help us in this mission. Join us. Our National Professional Advisor Network, also known as NPAN, is available to you for resources and to find a personal director in your area. I encourage, encourage you to visit us at our website, cancer.org slash NPAN, and click the join now to learn more about the important work we're doing. With your support, you can help the vision to end cancer as we know it. Thanks again to all and enjoy the rest of the call. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, NPAN is a wonderful organization. Uh, they're not going to hassle you with endless emails. They give you resources. They give you access to uh, planning webinars. And uh, I can tell you a close friend of mine, uh, daughter, sadly, was diagnosed with a, a very terrible case of cancer. I spoke to Jennifer, and uh, uh, the next day she was on the phone with the father and uh, sending things to them and trying to help. Uh, in addition to the amazing research they do, they, they take care of incredible human needs. So. Uh, it's a great resource, not just to help clients that are doing charitable good, but 
if God forbid you, a loved one uh, needs it, uh, uh, you can talk to them. So Jennifer, appreciate it. And we'll, we'll see you and others uh, in future months. So again, um, I encourage you, and Mike is gonna be our shining example of a, a reader, and I'm thrilled that he did it. If you have an idea or thought about a future webinar topic when you see our advertisement, um, by all means, email Joy or I, and uh, yep. we can either just mention you, or in Mike's case, I said, hey, I like that idea. Why don't you come on the webinar? And he agreed <laughs> on like a day's notice to just come on and chat. So we really encourage um, uh, you to email us questions, planning ideas, comments, thoughts, uh, this is not going to be a lecture um, by us alone. It will include uh, uh, comments from you when you share them, and uh, we look forward to that. And as you can see from the background, there's no PowerPoint. I'm sitting in an armchair. We're trying to make this look a little different. So We'll see how this goes. <laughs> and, and we welcome feedback. Again, we're trying to do something different to make uh, the educational process really practical, emphasis practical. Because when I, I, I've always tried to use what I've referred to, and I don't know if I've ever told you this, Joy, the matchbook theory. When, when somebody attends, a, a, whether it's a webinar or a lecture, I, my, my feeling as an attendee when I participate, or as a lecturer when I'm thinking of what the audience wants, I wanna be able to write down on the back of a matchbook, right, on the back of a matchbook, small, enough right. ideas that I can go back to my practice, use and make enough money to pay for the time that I spent at the webinar. People like to take home, in my view, practical, real-world nuggets they can use. So that's what that's what we're trying to do with this. And so that sounds better than what I described to my kids, because I told them that whenever I do a presentation, I like to send everybody home with a to-do list, right? I want to give everybody, you know, action items, things that they can take with them, and then bring it back, and and you know, stuff that they need to do. And and my kids said, and that just explains everything about that we need to know about you. So, you know, <laughs> yours is better. Yours sounds better. I might have to uh, adopt so, so, that and use it as my own. So he, uh, let me set it up and then I'm going to flip it to Joy. So yep. here's the problem. Client has grant or trust. Client is all juiced and excited while I'm doing these non-reciprocal slats. And we're going to do a program on the reciprocal trust doctrine and differentiating slats. We have to do that because everybody's talking about it. And I think there's an awful lot of misinformation. That's, that's going to be one of the future ones. But everybody has done slats or will do slats before 2026. There are tons of grant or trusts out there. Grant or trust, and we're going to talk about why. We'll give you some background for those that want it. Grant or trust are the cornerstone, the foundation of much of modern estate planning. The problem is that all the wonderful things that grant or trust do for planning, you can have too much of a good thing. So one of the greatest benefits of a grant or trust is what some practitioners call the tax burn. I get to pay the income tax on the, the slat that I created for my wife and, and descendants. And that's a good thing because the assets in the trust grow faster by virtue of me paying the tax. My estate shrinks from an asset protection perspective Growing assets inside the trust, shrinking assets that are exposed to creditors outside the trust, great stuff. But as with many things in life, right, if, if you, you actually eat that big bag of Costco-sized potato chips, you can have too much of a good thing. That's why we only buy small supermarket-sized potato chips, because <laughs> it's just not worth the, the exposure of that enticement. Too much of a good thing, the client comes back and says, you know, I'm really frustrated paying all this income tax. That can occur for a variety of reasons. And we're going to talk about that because the answer may be you turn off grant or trust status, but there's a lot of other practical answers you need to go through with the client. And, and one of the reasons, and I want to infuse every talk we have with this concept of defensive practice, there's already been at least one, and there's probably others that I just don't recall right now, malpractice case, where a client was claiming in an action against the attorney that they lost the swap power. They turned off grant or trust status by getting rid of swap power. And the client was claiming, golly gee, I didn't know that I was losing my ability to swap assets. And they sued the lawyer. Hello? Really? Okay. So you got to be mindful of what is happening when you're dealing with this issue. We're going to talk about that. But really as, as a background, and, and forgive us if this is too basic for some of you, but I always like hearing the background stuff because sometimes, you know, a bell goes off and say, you know, yeah, I knew that, but now I'm thinking right. about it. Joy, why don't so, you talk a little bit about grant or trust status? 
Yeah, so I, I think it's important to set the table, right? So so what we're doing is we're, we've got the issue. The issue is I'm a grantor. I don't want to pay the taxes anymore. So we thought it was important to kind of go through, well, why why do grantor trusts exactly work that way? And and basically it goes back to the uh, the subchapter J uh, rules, uh, section 671 to section 678, which lay out different things that make a trust a grantor type trust and say that if you have any of these types of powers, if you retain these rights to, you know, you know, interact with your trust in this particular, in these particular ways, we're going to tax you uh, as though that income was still yours. And so we create these grantor type trusts with these these provisions in them in order to cause the income to be taxed to the grantor. And, but at the same time, because the trust is irrevocable, because the trust for section 2036 and section 2038 purposes is outside of the individual's estate, then for an estate tax purpose, it actually works because the assets in the trust are outside of the estate growing and growing, and the income is flowing or being treated as though it is the grantor's obligation to pay the taxes on it, so the grantor is able to reduce the size of their estate by that tax burden. So that's essentially what's happening. And there are certain uh, rules, and we, we lay them out uh, for you in our white paper, but there are certain rules that make a trust a grantor-type trust. So the first one is, is that if the beneficial enjoyment, section 674, if the beneficial enjoyment of the assets in the trust are controlled by the grantor or a non-adverse party, that's going to make the trust a, uh, a grantor trust. So what's an adverse party? Typically, an adverse party is someone who is uh, going to benefit from the, the trust if that distribution, if that 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 right or that that you know uh, that distribution is not made. Uh, so so generally, you'll see you know the adult children of the uh, grantor would likely be adverse parties. Then there's IRC Internal Revenue Code Section 675, which says that there are certain administrative powers which, if exercisable by the grantor for the benefit of the grantor rather than for the benefit of the trust beneficiaries, those powers exercisable in a non-fiduciary capacity are going to make that trust a grantor trust. And this is where you see the, these are really the, the, the crux of the trust, the grantor trust powers, right? These are the things that we're really going to see in our trust agreement. For example, the swap power that Marty just talked about. That's it. That's Internal Revenue Code section 675.3. That's the power, uh, actually 675.4 rather, the power to swap, the power to substitute assets for uh, assets of an equivalent value. 675.3 is the power to borrow trust assets for less than adequate interest or less than adequate security. If the grantor retains that right and the trustee, you know, basically can't stop them, in that situation, the grantor is going to be treated as the owner of the assets in the trust for income tax purposes. Those are the two typical ones we see. The other typical one that we see, uh, as, as Marty had suggested, is that if my trust is set up for the benefit of my spouse, and distributions can be made to my spouse without an adverse party approving of those transfers, then that will make the trust a grantor trust. Finally, the last one that we're gonna see most typically is where the income or the principal of a trust can be used by the trustee to pay premiums on the insurance policy on the life of either the grantor or the grantor spouse. Those are typically the rules that are going to make a trust a grantor trust for income tax purposes, but not necessarily includable in the grantor's estate for estate tax purposes. And that's where you get the phrase intentionally defective grantor trust. For income tax phrase. purposes, I know. <laughs> for income tax purposes, it's included in your estate. For estate tax purposes, it's excluded from your estate. And a grantor trust is a defective grantor trust, is an intentionally defective grantor trust, they're all the same thing. I prefer to just call them grantor trusts because I think it's easier, uh, you know, and, and I'm not a big fan of the intentionally defective grantor trust either. So let right. me make a couple of comments on what Joy said. We're not getting into the weeds on the details of what she just said. 
but there is an awful lot to unpack there. The definitions of adverse party versus non-adverse party are complicated and there's un uncertainty about it. Um, we, we all, I believe, and I think that's a fair statement, but certainly the vast majority of practitioners for most of estate planning uh, during my career for 40 plus years would treat a typical insurance trust as a grant or trust just on the basis that the trustee could use income earned by the trust to pay premiums. And that's not so clear, but we're not going to get into it. I mean, does that make it grantors to income only? Does it make it grantors to principal, as to both? What if there is no income? There's lots of issues. Now, one of the reasons this is all really critically important, we're going to touch on this again, but we're not going to take a deep dive on, on it in this session because it's just not time and it's not our main topic, is if you want to turn off grant or trust status to stop the tax burn as an issue, you're going to have to parse through all the uh, comments that Joy made, see which of the powers that taint or characterize the trust as grantor are in the instrument and figure out how to turn off each of those. The insurance powers, particularly nettlesome, because can the how, how do you turn off the ability of uh, a trustee to use income of the trust to pay for premiums? Um, and one of the things that I, I've included for many years in some trusts is the power in, in, in a trust protector to, to uh, turn off the right of the, the trustee uh, to do that. So those are the powers. But you're also, make... but but a port about that. You're also going to have to transfer that insurance policy or do something if you actually own an insurance policy. Just turning off that power may not be sufficient if the policy is still owned by the trust and premiums still have to be paid. Because even if the trustee is is doesn't explicitly have that power, if they're doing it. There is, uh, there are rules out there. There, are, there are revenue rulings that say that we're still going to treat that as a grant or trust. Yeah, it's 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 complicated. But the point is, these are the powers you're going to have to look at if you decide to turn off grant or trust status. These are the powers you want to understand because this is what makes the trust a grant or trust. Now, Joy, let's let's just talk about uh, very briefly just some of the very common grant or trust because. They're ubiquitous in estate planning. You want to just summarize yeah. real quick some of the, the common things just to sort of, as you, I'll use your phrase, sure. setting the table. Setting the table, right. So the spousal lifetime access trust. Uh, Marty already brought it up. I'm sure we're going to bring it up a bunch more times uh, in, this, in this call. Uh, the spousal lifetime access trust is, is, the, is the trust that, that we're seeing a lot of. People like the idea of creating a trust for the benefit of their spouse. Uh, they feel that it gives them additional flexibility as they go forward and in, in, in life to see if, you know, anything were to happen in, you know, 10, 15, 20 years, they're ever going to need distributions from it. The spousal lifetime access trust could provide that flexibility depending on the terms of that trust. And generally speaking, under uh, Section 674, if a trust is available for the benefit of the spouse without an adverse party having to approve those distributions to the spouse, in that case, that trust will be treated as a grantor trust. So spousal lifetime access trust or SLATs, uh, also called spousal access trust, those types of trusts generally are, uh, you know, used as grantor trust. They're a typical kind of grantor trust. The irrevocable life insurance trust, which we had just talked about. So generally under section 677, if the uh, trustee has the power to use the income or the principal to pay premiums on a life insurance policy that ensures the life of the grantor or the grantor spouse, that will be a grantor trust. So an islet is a typical kind of in, uh, grantor type trust. Also, and it's, and it's literally in the title, grantor retained annuity trusts or GRATs are grantor trusts, where I as a grantor retain the right to receive an annuity for a term of years. That trust, at least during the term of that annuity period, is going to be considered a grantor trust. A qualified personal residence trust, again, I have set up a trust. I put my house into it. I retain the right to use that property for a period of time. I have a retained interest in those trusts. Now, those are two special kinds of trusts because they're, they're kind of different from what we're talking about because during the term of the GRAT and the CUPRIT, the Qualified Personal Residence Trust, 
uh, those assets in the trust are going to be includable in the grantor's estate, but it's still important to bring them up and sometimes uh, they will pour into a grantor type, type trust, a flat or some other grantor trust for a variety of reasons. So those are your typical grantor trusts. So let me just recap so you, we're, we're all together. The whole point of our discussion for this segment is I have a grant of trust. I'm tired of paying the income tax on it. What can I do? We talked about what makes a trust a grant or trust, which is critical to understand to the planning we're going to talk about. We talked about what types of trusts are commonly and, and they're ubiquitous in planning. They're the foundation of much modern estate planning. What are some of the benefits? And I'm going to do this quickly because we want to save time for the other discussions. But the benefits that this planning, by using the mechanisms in the different code sections Joy provided, and this will all be in the white paper that's on your handout screen, which you can download. Um, the benefits are dramatic. Very important to understand them. Um, if you have a grant or trust, you can borrow as the settlor trust or grant or the person who created the trust, you can borrow money out of the trust without adequate consideration. You should pay adequate interest. There's a concern that would raise an estate inclusion issue if you don't. So you can give somebody, your old college roommate, uh, in a non-fiduciary capacity, so they have no one to answer to, the power, the unfettered power to loan you trust assets. So even if you have an institutional trustee, if I gave Joy the power to loan me money out of the slant I created, the trustee, the institution can never say no. That's really powerful. Second, I can sell assets to the trust. So if you have a client with a family business, real estate holdings, they can sell that to the trust and grow that out of the estate. And if you have a client with a family business and you're selling 50% or less, and you're getting a 30%, 40% marketability, lack of control, et cetera, discount, and you're valuing it not on uh, you know, the price that a special interest may pay for, it, but on an arm's length, willing buyer, willing seller, you may be able to move that business out of your estate without triggering income tax at a fraction of the cost, huge estate tax play. I can swap assets in and out. So let's say you put the family business into a trust, and uh, your oldest daughter was going to be the intended heir, and you had the trust structured for that to reflect that. And now it's your youngest son that's going to become the heir apparent to the business. And what do you do with that irrevocable trust? You swap the asset out, and you can redo the whole estate plan. You get backsies, which you don't get in a lot of things. So those are some of the incredible benefits that are very powerful to planning. Why am I saying that? You all know that. Because you want to make sure to, and I think you should document. I want to set it up as a standard of practice, but document and writing to the client. Hey, if you're upset about this grant or trust tax burn, we may be able, and we've talked about some of the issues, we'll talk about them again, turn off grant or trust status to cut off prospectively, not historically, but prospectively having to continue to pay that tax burn. But you're going to lose a lot of really significant benefits. And that's really at the heart of the conversation that I think as practitioners, we should have with clients when they come to us complaining about the grant to trust burn. I think you want to take a pause, time out client, time. Let's go through why you did this in the first place. Because even though you had these discussions with the client when you set up the trust, they may not remember. I think you want to talk to them about what fundamentally creates a grant to trust and why it's so important what we just did. And not just generically like we did, but specifically for them given whatever their financial the situation balance sheet family structure is because before you tinker with what may have been a great plan and may still be a great plan make sure the client understands it and i would document it and as i cautioned earlier there's at least one case i'm aware of where a client made a claim against the attorney for turning off grant or trust status even though the client was complaining about it because then they lost the swap power well hello wasn't that part of the discussion i think so put it in writing to protect yourself now um, Joy, I, I don't know how much time we have. We were going to talk briefly about some of the administration of grant or trust and some of the tax reporting. Can you do that real quick? Because I think we want to. I can wanna... do that really quickly. Yeah. Okay. So, so uh, generally but speaking, I here. could do it really quickly. Yeah. I, and and look, you know, you should be working with a with a qualified accounting firm whenever you have these trusts, so that you can make sure that you're you're filing things correctly. Uh, but essentially, Which when, is it, when you have not a grant, the case, by the way, I'm sorry to interrupt. Well, right. I've seen some awful <laughs> wrong things, awfully bad stuff. So, so the question always arises, do I need to get a, an EIN number? Do I need a taxpayer identification number for my grant or trust? And because the trust, the income from the trust is going to flow through to the individual grant or, 
you know, that's a, that's an open question. And, uh, you know, I've seen practitioners all across the board on this, on this question. Um, because generally speaking, the trustee's obligation is to give the grantor sufficient information so that they can file their individual income tax return, which does not mean you have to file an income tax return. So some grantor trusts file them, some don't. And that really is going to be something that you're going to have to work through with your practitioner and, you know, in consultation again with a competent accounting firm. Non-grantor trusts, the question's easier, right? You should have an EIN number because it is a separate taxpayer. It has its own filing requirements if the income, the gross income is over $600 or it has any taxable income. Uh, and then there are a couple of other, uh, you know, much more, you know, uh, detailed reasons why you would need to file an income tax return for a non-grantor trust. Uh, but certainly they will need their own EIN number and file a return. By the way, and this is something that uh, I, I think is, is obvious to all of you, but let me just say the obvious because sometimes it, it's helpful to hear what you, you know just to make sure you don't forget and it's front of mind because we all have way too much on our plates at all times. That's part of the fun of being a practitioner. <laughs> um, you, 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 this is a team sport, folks. This is a team sport, right? You, 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 you want to have the accountant involved. You want to have the attorney involved. If the accountant tries doing this on their own, they may misinterpret some of the provisions of the trust. That's not going to be helpful. The attorney wants to have someone that understands all the income tax implications. You don't want to go and turn off grantor trust status and, oh, gee, golly, we just found out we triggered this uh, significant income tax because of the nature of the underlying assets and liabilities. You don't want to do any of this without understanding how the compliance, the reporting of it is, is being required. With all due respect to all my colleagues, some of us at the uh, bar sometimes uh, uh, minimize the vital importance of how tax returns are filed. It's not just a compliance matter, it's essential and fundamental to the planning. Uh, and as Mike will demonstrate later, you probably want your insurance advisor and wealth advisor in involved in the discussions as well. Uh, too often Absolutely. clients don't like having everyone involved. You have issues of uh, tainting privilege, but y this is a team sport to do it right. Now, let me let me talk about uh, another topic. Um, uh, we, we, I'll tell you a quick story that, that tees up this topic. So when I moved to New York uh, a long, long time ago, there was a locksmith store um, uh, that unfortunately was a great locksmith store and I used it many times, but uh, they tore the building down when they built the Citibank Tower there. Um, but there was a great sign in the locksmith store. It said, cost to fix a lock, $5. Cost to fix a lock if you want to watch, $10. Cost to fix a lock if you want to help, $25. Cost to fix a lock, and this is the important point to our discussion of grant to trust. If you worked on it before you brought it into the shop, $50. So here's the problem. Many of our clients resort to self-help because what we do is very inconsequential and not very technical. And they, they all know what to do because, you know, they're very smart and whatever respective profession they are, so they, they, they're smart people, they know what to do. Too often, and this is something I think you need to look into before you even start to suggest uh, ways to address the planning to uh, deal with the grant to trust burn, what has the client done before they showed up at your door? So for example, did the trust have a tax reimbursement clause? That may solve the problem, we're gonna talk briefly about that in a minute. But if the trust did or did not have a tax reimbursement clause, Uncle Joe or Aunt Jane, the family-friendly trustee, may have been reimbursing for taxes because they, you know, the 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 client's uh, friends have uh, uh, slats and they had tax reimbursement clauses. The client may not understand that they don't have a clause, and they may be getting reimbursements for taxes that they weren't entitled to. Secondly, and I've seen horrific misadministration of tax reimbursement clauses. Was anyone even looking at what it was? The way to do a ta handle a tax reimbursement clause correctly is to have the client CPA make a calculation of the tax cost incurred by the client on trust income and use that as an amount and save that in the files to justify and support the tax reimbursement that was made by an independent trustee, preferably. Sometimes people just reimburse whatever they want. So you got to find out what's going on because if, if the tax reimbursement process was mishandled, you may already have another issue to do. Because don't forget, the client may have already tried to self-administer help before they showed up. Um, so tax administration uh, reimbursement clause, you got to look at what was done. Now, they, they, what about loans to the settlor? The clients may have resorted to loans because they had a tax bill to pay. They needed the money. Their accountant said, you got X dollars, you know, hundreds of thousands, millions of dollars due in tax, get the money. And the client just borrowed the money from the trust. Was there a note? Was it done properly? Was it compliant with whatever provisions were required in the trust instrument? 
find out what was going on. You got to clean that up as well. Uh, I've seen situations, and I don't think this is something many people have focused on. Uh, I create a trust for my wife and descendants, a SLAT. I'm feeling pressure because we have a tax liability on a joint income tax return. So I just get, you know, my my college roommate, the the uh, you know, make who's the tr friendly trustee, give my wife a distribution. And I'm going to use that money to pay the income tax. Well, was that distribution compliant with the standards for distribution under the trust? Maybe there's a HEMS limitation, and this well exceeded that. Find out what's been going on with the administration of the trust because the client's resort to self-help may have already tainted the trust. And part of what you may need to do is not just address the client's what we call grant or trust angst over the tax bill, but cleaning up the administration of the trust so it's been so done Marty, properly. I I think it's important to talk about, well, what happens if you did taint the trust? What happens if the course of performance between the trustee and the grantor uh, suggests that there's some kind of an implicit arrangement whereby I have a tax bill and the trust is going to pay it, or you know, my spouse is getting distributions that exceed the limitations in the trust agreement, or I have loans that are not documented. What, what happens then? So what? Look, you may have already blown the trust. I don't think there's any bright line law you can point to. You have recent cases like Smaldino and Sorensen that, that suggest that when you don't administer a trust properly, uh, it may blow up. But in, in fact, in those cases, I don't know that corrective measures were taken on any of the issues. There was no right. indication they were. They probably weren't. So if you find, and listen, we see this in all areas of practice, and I'm kind of speaking from the hip because I don't know what law there is on it, but my feeling, and you can chime in if you feel differently, is when you identify administration problems, and the same thing in operation of a business entity, it's, it's the same across the board. When things are done wrong, identify it, correct it. So if there was a distribution that was made that was inappropriate, uh, document it is intended to have been a loan, calculate interest, and have it repaid. You have to do what you can to patch it up because what else can you do? I mean, sometimes the the weight, if you will, of the misadministration is just so heavy that you almost feel the transaction needs to be unwound and 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 started again. But if you unwind a an estate planning transaction like a transfer to a trust, you probably can't have any basis to recoup the exemptions that were allocated. So you really have to clean it up. And I think you're in a listen. I would much rather be in a position. Where if I were the the these in the Smaldino case, and I don't know how you correct, you know, a transfer where you only held the stock or the LLC interest for a day, but all the other issues, I would go back and correct with amended tax returns. I would document things properly. Um, that, that's actually an interesting because, question. That yeah, yeah because on. if we don't, I mean, I think that because if we don't, like the worst case scenario is, is that the assets in the trust could could potentially be pulled back into the estate. You could lose the essential purpose of setting up the trust in the first place. And I think that's where clients that's who are engaging in self-help, right? And where, where clients are engaging in self-help, they're not recognizing, they're not remembering those conversations that we had with them when we originally set up the trust. Again, another good reason to have competent, you know, uh, counselors and, and competent uh, accountants throughout the process to kind of keep an eye on the shop and make sure that, you know, things are going the way that they're supposed to go and that these types of self-help, uh, you know, endeavors are not, not happening. So let me cover two, two, uh, our next two topics quickly, because I want to leave time for a lot of other stuff that we have. Um, so th the next step after you've determined self-help, after you understand and explain again to the client why this is all happening, because a lot of times the whole problem is the client just doesn't remember what's going on and they forgot that this was a good thing and they thought a good thing was a bad thing, right? So after all the things we've talked about, I think the next question is a financial analysis. And this is why lawyers should not be doing this on their own unless they have the wherewithal to really do uh, proper financial forecasting. And honestly, I don't do it and I've seen attorneys, um, uh, I don't see attorneys very often do it. Uh, sometimes when I've seen attorneys do it, they really don't have the capabilities and the, the software even that accounting firms or wealth advisory firms do to do this. You want a financial analysis done. When the client did the SLAT or other irrevocable grant or trust planning from at inception, we recommend 100% of the time that everybody have their wealth advisor 
and or accountant, I don't care who does it as long as it's done well, do financial modeling to see what it is. So if when a client comes back with what we've dubbed grant or trust angst, you know, the frustration over paying the tax bill, after explaining everything, if we still have a problem, what I'd like to say to the client is let me see, or if we have it in our files, the financial models that were done when this plan was created. Too often, the reality is clients don't listen. They don't want to spend the time and the money. They just want the trust done. In fairness to us as practitioners, in 2012, 2020, 2021, we all thought the law would change imminently, and we just had to rush through the planning, and there wasn't time to get this done. So if you have existing financial modeling, go back and get it. If there isn't some, get the wealth advisor and or CPA or a team of the CPA and wealth advisor and get some modeling done. Why? What was in the original modeling when the trust was set up years ago? What did it forecast would be the income tax impact back to the client? What did it forecast the wealth transfer would be in terms of growth of assets inside the trust and the tax burn impact on the client's estate? Has something changed? In many cases, you'll find nothing has changed. The trust may be performing exactly as it is, and the client just didn't remember what was going on. In other instances, you may find from looking at the old analysis or the, the new analysis, and you definitely want an updated financial analysis, is the client may have significant medical expenses they didn't have before. One of the issues we've seen, it's a very common one when a client comes in complaining about you know, the grant or trust tanks, I don't want to pay this tax cost. What it turns out has happened, and we had this recently with a client that was unhappy with grant or trust burn, uh, they, they had like, I don't know, a $40 million estate. They went out and bought a uh, $12 million vacation home. Well, a $12 million vacation home, when you look at taking $12 million out of your investment portfolio and putting it into a non-income producing asset, not to mention the proverbial white elephant, you got to pay property tax, insurance, carrying costs, maintenance. Uh, it must cost a bear to heat that thing, right? $12, $12 million vacation home, uh, and it was in Wisconsin. I, I imagine it gets rather cold there in the winter. So, you know, they changed the whole dynamic of their financial plan. They didn't talk to us. They just did it. Well, that has an impact. Now, at least we've identified what the source of the problem was. So the client at least understand why they're having a problem. And then we can intelligently go back and try to figure out what to do with it. So maybe what you do is you swap the vacation home or part of the vacation home into the trust and take the income producing assets out of the trust. So now you have income producing assets where the client's getting the cash flow and the non-income producing asset inside the trust, you may have solved the problem. You need to understand economically what's going on. It's not just a legal issue. If you try to do surgery without finding out all the, the, the main factors about the patient, you're not going to come up with the right answer. Next point, and I want to do this one very quickly, um, but it's got to be on the table. Um, and I kind of referred to this in, 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 in the outline, I think somewhere as a Dr. Phil moment. What's going on, client? Tell me about your family. You're going to find in a good number of cases, and we've seen this one, this is probably the second most common case of why clients are upset about grant or trust burn. The vacation home's been number one, Dr. Phil moments number two. None of the technical stuff that we've been talking about has been the primary two issues that we've seen where clients are upset about it. They're just upset with their kid. Their kid had the nerve, the audacity to go marry someone that the client doesn't like. My, have you ever heard of that? Right? Never. My wife, Mary can you imagine how her family felt? <laughs> the, the point is that when the clients view relationship feelings towards the beneficiaries has changed, that may be the cause of why they're upset paying the income tax. When they loved their beloved son or daughter or kid, heir, nephew, niece, whoever it was that was the beneficiary of the trust, they were just very happy to shift as much wealth as possible to them. But now that the kid's gone on a, on a, a lifestyle path that they don't like or his, the relationship is soured, they feel very differently about the wealth transfer that's occurring. Why is that important for us to understand? Because if the whole cause of this issue is not that the plan's malfunctioning, but rather that the client's relationship has changed, you need to deal with that differently. And, 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 and forgive me, I know we're all you know, attorneys, accountants, wealth advisors, but the client may need to, to talk to a, a therapist and find out how to deal with these feelings. That may be the issue. Now, from our legal and, and planning, estate planning perspective, if the client's relationship has completely fallen apart, not on a temporary basis, because you certainly don't want to change something, there's things you can do. If X dollars have been moved to the trust client, maybe you revise your 
will or revocable trust, whichever is the primary dispositive document, and change what's going to the kid. Those big IRAs change the beneficiary designation. That may be the solution. And that's why you have to have this sort of broad, holistic discussion. That's why I like a team approach, because the attorney and accountant may not have the relationship. The wealth advisor may be picking up on these personal matters that the client doesn't tell us about. But you may just want to change the dispositive scheme of the other documents, and there's no tax issue to really deal with. So you need to take this holistic approach. Joy. It is important to take a holistic approach. I do want to, you know, bring up some other, you know, I have some thoughts on that too. Um, you know, one of the things that we, we talk to clients about is moving the, the, the family business, right? You know, it's, it's the management succession, ownership succession conversation that we have with our business succession clients. And in those conversations, we learn, you know, look, ownership succession is kind of easy. I want my adult child to eventually own the business. The management succession piece is a little harder because the, uh, the, the parent tends to, you know, want to, you know, sometimes wants to hold on, right? Not ready to retire, not ready to give up control, not ready to walk away, whereas the adult child feels more than ready to take over. And when the business, when, when interest in the business, even if they're non-voting shares, but when those shares are in the business and they're earning income, well, even if we've finally gotten the parent to step away and allow the adult child to have some management of the business and control things, because on an annual basis, we're coming back to the parent and saying, oh, by the way, you have to pay income taxes now on this business income that's been earned. That kind of brings the parent back. So for some family dynamic, for some business succession issues, that also needs to be addressed and understood because sometimes it's better for the business to consider turning off grants or trust status or moving the assets somewhere so that the parent doesn't have to keep coming back and looking at the financials and what's going on in the underlying business. That might also help with the family dynamic and the succession of the business. Joy, we're getting tight a little on time. Let me let me just tee up the next section and let you cover it. So the, sure. the next topic to talk about after we, we've you explained to the client what's going on, you make sure they understand what's going on, you went through the history, you talked to them about the, the importance of grant or trust status and why they did it, you address whether there's a real financial implication, whether there's interfamily, interrelationship issues. The next way to deal with this problem, now that you've established that it's a real problem and those other things don't suffice, client understands implications um, is to get more cash flow out of the trust back to the client and joy I'm gonna let you go through all that but the bottom line is a lot of times clients aren't administering the trust right they don't come back to all their advisory team for an annual review which they should do and they may not even realize what uh, functionality is in the trust that will permit them from a tax reimbursement to other things why don't you chat about that for for a few minutes and then we'll go on to our other topics well, I do think that we talked about tax reimbursement clauses, but I do think some of the points that we raised kind of, you know, require a revisit, right? So tax reimbursement clauses, first of all, let's let's start with Revenue Ruling 2004-64, which provides that the, the fact that the grantor is paying the taxes on the income earned by the trust, which I don't know about you, but if Marty told me he was willing to pay my ta my taxes for a year, I would feel like that was a pretty big benefit. I, I would find that to be a, quite a quite a gift. Uh, but revenue Not ruling two thousand. Are you sure? Because I don't mind really. It would be okay with me. Uh, but revenue ruling two thousand four sixty four says that. It is not a gift to that trust, even though clearly the individual grantor is benefiting the beneficiaries of the trust by paying the taxes on the income earned. So, you know, so that's that's first. We know that even though it's a huge benefit, it is not a uh, it's not a gift. Uh, so we look to the tax reimbursement clause to because, you know, again, parent might not really want to be paying these taxes. Maybe we've evaluated it and determined that, yeah, there is a financial need here. Uh, so we want to look, first of all, read the trust agreement. You know, we haven't seen it in a while. It's a 90 page trust document, particularly if Marty Schenkman drafted it. Uh, so you want to be looking through that trust agreement to see if there's a tax reimbursement clause. 
But then it's going to be important to make sure that everybody understands how that works. And I think this is where documenting it and really analyzing what do we have to do in order to invoke this tax reimbursement clause, you know, and make sure that we're doing that thing. Generally, an independent trustee is a better person to approve uh, the tax reimbursement clause. And I think there are some states, there are some states that require that only an independent trustee can approve a reimbursement back to the grantor. Uh, and I think that there would be some risk if it were a related or subordinate trustee uh, who approved the tax reimbursement. You want to have some kind of an analysis done uh, by the, the trust accountant to evaluate what the income tax burden actually is on the grantor from the income earned by the trust. And you know, it's also a really good idea if that independent trustee says no once in a while. We want to avoid there being an implicit arrangement whereby grantor says, hey, I need $100,000 and trustee says, here's a check. You want there to be an analysis you want that to be backed up with some kind of documentation, and you want the independent trustee to exercise independence in making the decision as to whether or not to reimburse the grantor. All of those things will go a long way in proving that this was not an implicit arrangement that could then show a too much of a link between the grantor and the grantor trust. So some of the other things, Joy, for distributions, what are the distribution provisions? Is there a DAP, hybrid DAP? Do you want to just in like a minute talk about some of those because the bottom line is you got to review the trust document. Clients don't remember what's in it and there may be distribution provisions that's, that solve the day. You want to just comment real quick on some yeah. of those, Joy? So, so generally speaking, there are, there are certain types of trusts that are, have to be carefully drafted by a competent professional uh, that would ha allow for the trustee or a distribution committee to add back the grantor or make distributions to the grantor. Uh, and those are, you know, generally speaking, domestic asset protection trusts, uh, a trust that I set up for the purpose of protecting my assets. In that case, you might have an opportunity to make a distribution. But again, it's going to be really crucial to understand the terms of the trust agreement and make sure that you're following them. Uh, the other one, I guess, would be a, a spousal lifetime access trust uh, where you can make distributions to the spouse. But I think as Marty had said earlier in this program, uh, you want to make sure that you're following the terms of the trust agreement in making those distributions and, and, and meeting those distribution standards in making that distribution. Also, you, you know, if the grantor's income tax liability is $100,000 and it's due on April 15th, Boy, I'd really like to see that distribution be in some different amount to the spouse and maybe at a different time of year. So uh, just again for big picture, we've evaluated the issue. We've explained to the client why this was done because they probably forgot. We looked at the financial analysis and did an updated one to see what's changed so that we understand really where this issue is coming from. We talked about personal issues in case those were the issues and dealt with that if it was. If that's not it, then we try to get more cash out of the trust to deal with the grant to trust angst of the tax burn from tax reimbursement or seeing all these different distribution provisions. A few of the other things that, that we can do, and all this is gonna be noted in the white paper you can download. Um, we've talked about the loan power. That's what makes the trust a grant to trust. Use it, use it properly. If I need money to pay the income tax burden because I had a big capital gain, that uh, a big um, uh, income, uh, gain realization event that's flowing through to me personally, um, you know, having a periodic, sporadic, that once in a 10 year period reimbursement probably is not going to create an implied agreement issue to the extent that of an annual reimbursement might. So I'm, I should look at getting a loan from the trust if the tax reimbursement clause doesn't exist or is inadequate, right? It may not be enough. So I can get a loan, make sure it's properly documented. I can have does the uh, grantor have any uh, liquid assets in their name maybe they own a piece of land or a property you had mentioned earlier that you know you have this 12 million dollar vacation home maybe you can take that illiquid non-income producing asset and sell it or swap it into the trust and take back some of the cash from the trust in order to you know protect against that grantor trust angst and that solves the problem two ways what joy just said First, you're, you're, you're infusing cash back to the client's name, the settler's name, so they can pay their tax burden and stop complaining. Secondly, what you're doing is taking income-producing assets out of the trust because the client's not getting the cash flow from that income. 
putting a non-income producing asset, the vacation home, raw land, uh, et cetera, uh, private equity that's not going to mature for years to come inside the trust so that you're, you're changing the future for coming years income tax profile of the client versus the trust um, by putting non-liquid assets, non-income producing assets in the trust, putting income producing assets back in. So swapping, selling, distributions, tax reimbursement, these are all ways to deal with it. Now, the, the, the final option is to turn off grant or trust status. And let's wrap up with that. I think we have four minutes, Joy. Um, before yep. you turn off grant or trust status, might I trigger an unexpected income tax problem by doing that? Why don't you mention yes. that and let's talk about how to turn it off. Again, you've got to reach out to your accounting firm. It's really, really important. First of all, you've got to understand what all the assets in the trust are before you're even considering grant or turning off grant or trust status. And once you evaluate what those assets are, you've got to confirm that turning off grant or trust status which essentially, if you're doing it voluntarily, could be considered a transfer from the individual grantor for income tax purposes to a non-grantor trust, which is now a third party, again, for income tax purposes, that conversion could trigger a gain, particularly to the extent, this is where we see it in the most, is where you have a partnership asset, a partnership interest in the trust with a negative capital account. Um, you know, no such thing as a negative basis, but uh, you'll have zero basis, negative capital account, some kind of a debt on that interest. And then by converting that asset from a grantor trust asset to a non-grantor trust status the asset, you could potentially trigger gain that the grantor would then have to pay that could be really problematic. Really, really important to consult with the accounting firm before doing this. And look, there are options that you can undertake in order to avoid that triggering, even if you still proceed with the turning off of grant or trust status. Uh, the most obvious to me is you could swap out the asset right before uh, the, the, the conversion, but you need to have that conversation. If the Sale to a grantor trust is still outstanding. That promissory note is still not paid off. You can't, you really shouldn't be turning off grantor trust status. Now, if you decide to turn off grantor trust status, and as I said a couple of times, because I think it's very important to protect you as the practitioner, put it in writing to the client that they're losing all the benefits that were part of the plan originally. And, and that's why it's important to do the financial analysis. I didn't say it, but it's in the white paper. You want to find out is this grant or trust angst temporary or permanent? If it's temporary, I really would be reluctant to lose all the great benefits grant or trust status is currently providing under the tax laws. On the other hand, if it's a permanent situation because there has been a significant economic change or family change and you want to turn it off, okay, document it. How do you turn it off? You have to comb through the trust and find each of the things that Joy explained in the beginning of our discussion. That's part of the reason she did it. So now if you want to turn it off, you have to turn off each of those mechanisms. So if there's a power to loan to the grantor for less than adequate interest or adequate uh, consideration, and you don't want to make adequate interest, but I don't know what's in the trust document, you want to make sure that power is turned off or relinquished by the person holding the power. Second, if there's um, uh, the ability to swap assets, you have to have that relinquished by whoever holds that power. If the spouse is a beneficiary, it has to change to being a beneficiary only on the approval of an adverse party. And spouse may not be very happy about that. And if there's a later divorce and now, you know, an adverse party who's also a beneficiary has to approve distributions to the spouse, was this part of a plan? Do you need separate representation? Not simple. So you can then evaluate turning off each grant or trust status. You may do that through a decanting. I would rather see first each of the power holders relinquish the power that creates the grant or trust status, even if you then decant to make sure you've doubly uh, confirmed that it's a non-grant or trust. Joy, I think we're out of time um, and we should just kind of wrap up. You want to do a quick wrap? And then we'll yeah, bring I, up I think that. 
I think that our, it's funny because I think that, you know, I, I, people probably have tuned in to figure out how do I turn off grant for trust status? And we spent most of the time trying to, uh, you know, convince them not to, right? <laughs> Which of course is, uh, is always kind of a fun way to, to approach things. But I, I think that the point is, is that, you know, grant for trust for the bee's knees. That's the thing. That, that's like, that's the best thing since sliced bread for estate planners. And, and there are good reasons for that. And we really need to be very careful and cautious when we work with a client who who has maybe a temporary situation by giving them a permanent type solution. We talk in the white paper about the risks of turning off grantor trust status and whether you can actually turn it back on again and whether that is actually an ideal situation. And I think we've concluded that it really probably isn't. So we really want to be very careful when stepping into this realm of turning off grant or trust status so that we can understand all of the ramifications and properly advise our clients. Yeah, I think the bottom line, if you haven't had a client come complaining about grant or trust burn, you will. And when you do, take this broad holistic approach that we've suggested. And if you've gone through every other analysis and option that we've discussed, and it's really a permanent problem, and turning off grant or trust status is the right thing to do, then in fact you do it. And another reason you may turn off grant or trust status has nothing to do with the grant or trust burn. It has to do with state income tax planning. And we're going to talk about state income tax issues in an upcoming program. Um, Mike, if you're there, can you join us? And what we're going to do is transition to one other planning idea. And um, I want to encourage all of you. Here he is. Hey. Yeah. Mike. Hey, Mike. So, tell me. so Mike's idea, and he was just, just a registrant like you folks, so you can you can be Mike next time. Mike's well, idea. Well, I think in fair disclosure, Marty, I do have to say that I have, I have, I, I have a relationship with Mike. We, we, you know, we work together, and uh, and he actually sent me a text like, "Hey, you got a few minutes?" And he Mike, brought the audio, idea. So, your audio is very bad. It's still working. Huh? Yeah, it's, it's terrible. okay. So, th so that was basically speaker, how we we. We brought it in, but we definitely want to hear from people. I think that that's the key. You know, this is, again, this is a team sport. It's very collaborative, and we would love to hear from you if you have any other suggestions. So, so Mike, Mike's idea, which I think is, is absolutely worth considering, and Joy and I did not talk about it, so this is an add-on bonus, folks. Why aren't you looking at the underlying composition of the investments inside the trust? Many of our clients, it's a family business. is nothing to discuss, but for an awful lot of clients, it could be investment assets or other things. Mike, what is your what is your insurance wrapper? Yeah, so I mean it's pretty basic that uh, people have investments and time out, you can time out, time out. Yep. Mike, are, tell everyone who you are. You want to All right. This, uh, I'm Mike Dranoff. I'm the principal of New Jersey Life and Casualty. We're celebrating our 75th anniversary uh, this year and our world is life insurance for wealthy folks. Uh, that's okay. See, now we can, send you a, we, can, we can send you a bill now for advertising. Tell everybody yeah. <laughs> how the insurance wrapper works. Yeah, basically you take your mutual fund investments uh, and if, if you have mutual funds and certainly most people have that within portfolios, you put that in a wrapper and it could be very conventional, variable universal life insurance. And the beauty of that is that it grows tax deferred. So the angst you've been talking about it still grows. It has a little drag for the cost of insurance, but you design it to have minimal amount of insurance. Uh, but that growth is still in equities. It still grows, but it grows tax deferred, no 1099s to the trust. You can take income out of life insurance policies tax free in a lot of situations. And at death, one of the things we haven't talked about is all this wonderful slat planning is that there is no step up in basis in those assets, right? You gave it away, it appreciated, and when you sell it, there's a gain. If, if in a life insurance wrapper, you enjoy tax deferred accumulation, the death benefit is tax free. So that growth in equities amasses to very large numbers, tax free access during lifetime, tax deferred accumulation, and a tax free death benefit to the trust when one dies. Uh, you can even add a little long-term care rider in there. A lot of times we have very wealthy clients that can self-insure that, but it's an interesting little add-on uh, that the trust could have some benefit in the event uh, the grantor has a, a qualifying event for long-term care. So that's kind of step one. Step two yeah. is more so, – go ahead, Joy. 
Yeah, I want to ask you a question. So, so essentially, what you're doing is you're, you're you, you've earned income, and the grantor is un, you know unhappy about how the income is growing, and that they're going to have to continue to pay taxes on that income that's growing. And of course, the natural thing to do when you earn a bunch of you know you have a bunch of money sitting is you reinvest it so that you can earn more income, right? The more you add to principal, the more interest, the more income you're going to earn. So, what you're suggesting is is that instead of reinvesting it in a taxable solution, which would be another, you know, buying another, it, it, investing it in more securities or, you know, reinvesting it in your portfolio. Instead, you take those profits and you put them into this life insurance product that then grows income tax free and can create an income tax or income tax free uh, return on investment. Is, is that right? It's basically you're That's tapping your income tax liability. That's exactly correct. All the all the interest and dividends and income are within a wrapper of a life insurance policy, which enjoys tax deferral. The more exotic, the more complex structure is private placement life insurance. That's where you can add some more sophisticated investments. Government's kind of looking at that. I would tread lightly there. Uh, the jury's out on how if they're going to come after that, but. You have, uh, you know, PE and VC and REITs all within these very complex private placement life insurance policies. Um, another interesting way for very sophisticated, very wealthy families, if you can put that investment that has tons of income that the, the grantor is tired of paying, put that in a wrapper of tax deferred accumulation, even in very sophisticated assets, that's another play. The other side of it is those that are looking at this as legacy planning, right? You you have $10 million of stocks and bonds in a portfolio. It's making 5% a year. There's a $500,000 angst that they, they are paying the income tax on. But that $5 million will grow exponentially. Over 20 years, it'll be another $15, $20 million. More income right. tax on that, more great estate planning, great burning down the estate if you have enough money to pay the tax on it. But if I can just cut it off today, we, we, we sometimes refer to it as a dividend reinvestment program. We take that dividend of 500,000 a year, procure a lot of life insurance, but not cash accumulation life insurance, death benefit life insurance. If this is a legacy play, I now have my grantor trust I'll never have any more income over the 5,000, 500,000, so I'm not reinvesting it. But I take that 500,000 and buy 50 million of life insurance that enjoys tax free distribution at death. Will the 500,000 a year accumulating taxable, no step up in basis, will that equal 50 million tax free of a different kind of insurance, more guaranteed insurance, not cash value driven? So. You know, the basis issue, which I know isn't today's topic, kind of cures two ills of these these wonderful planning tools, the income tax that you're paying and the step up in basis you don't get. Life insurance kind of fills both of those holes. So let me let me kind of make some concluding comments. Um, I think Mike's comments are great. Part of the conversation when a client has granted trust banks over the tax burn is in addition to all the things Joy and I talked about for an hour, is to look at the composition of the underlying assets. If it's family business, you may not really be able to do much with the assets, but oh, by the way, for succession planning, liquidity, and everything else, you may need insurance. I find that insurance is not addressed nearly enough in especially non-reciprocal slap planning. Clients do not use insurance nearly enough um, uh, to address the financial gaps in the plan. If a client is transferring 50% of their wealth to these slats to use up exemption before 2026, or they did the same kind of large wealth transfers in 2020, 2021, there may be a significant insurance need if there's premature death of, of one of the spouses. In many cases, you'll find that um, they, they, the clients are focused on using exemption, they're not going to trust friendly jurisdictions, DAP jurisdictions, where they're using SPATs, DAPs, or hybrid DAPs. That's not our discussion today. But as a result, when one spouse dies, the other spouse loses indirect access to half of their assets 
you may very well have a significant insurance need. So apart from the income tax benefit, you're, you're curing another major financial gap in the planning. And the reason those gaps aren't identified and addressed often is because clients don't go through the process that they should of having their wealth advisor, financial advisor, do a financial model of what this stuff's going to look like 10 or 20 years down the road. So part of the conversation on, on tax banks, just to conclude, should include what to do with the underlying assets. And if Mike's idea is put on the table, let the client reject it. You've now given them an idea. So I would suggest that in the majority of situations, offer the insurance idea, get an insurance expert at the table, let the client say no. You've now delivered another option to address it. And by the way, which we didn't say in our discussion before, but let me add with Mike, you don't need one solution in a lot of cases. You may achieve a right. better solution to the problem by you know, using a little of this and a little of that, right? The proverbial stew. Maybe you use an insurance wrapper for 30% of the assets because you don't want all your eggs in one basket. Maybe you do a swap for the vacation home for part of the rest of it. In a lot of cases, a more complex multi-step process will give the client a better, uh, more secure result than, than just uh, uh, the hammer, if you will, of removing grant or trust status. And as Joyce said, for now, until they change the law, grant or trust is really, um, I'll use Jonathan Blotmacher's phrase, the cat's meow <laughs> of, of planning. You don't want to get rid of it if you can avoid it. Maybe Mike's idea is part of the solution. So I want to thank uh, Joy and Mike and encourage all of you for future programs when you uh, get the um, uh, announcement. If you have planning ideas, even if you have just questions and you don't know the answer, questions. shoot it to us and we'll mm -hmm. try to uh, do it. We're happy to have you on. We're happy just to mention you. We're happy to do it anonymously. But, you know, we encourage uh, audience participation like back in school. Thank you, Mike. <laughs> um, thank, thank, thank you, you Mike. And uh, Joy and I are going to try somehow to do this every month and, and hope you can join us for that. Um, and please keep in mind that uh, all the information presented is for educational purposes only. You really want a multidisciplinary team to address it. And especially yeah. when you have uh, trust in different jurisdictions, you're going to need local counsel to address some of those issues as well. The simplistic approaches will often not be the best of answers. So be careful out there. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye.